You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. All right, everybody, good morning and welcome back. Welcome back to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. It is such an honor to be back and to start my week with my favorite people talking about a topic which is so fundamental and so essential in Judaism. So we mentioned previously that we're going to talk about the topic of emunah. Emunah means translated by most as faith. But in Judaism, we don't find the idea of faith. We don't have faith in God. We don't believe in God. We have a different commandment, and that is to have knowledge of God. We mentioned this in the previous couple of weeks, but we weren't live and we weren't recording for our podcast. I was traveling. I apologize. But we have this idea of having knowledge of God, knowledge of God. And having that knowledge is different than any of the other uh, methods that other religions use to connect with our Creator. Other religions have this idea of taking a leap of faith. They have a, uh, a threat. If you don't believe in our Lord and Savior, if you don't, you have eternal damnation or you're considered an infidel or you'll be, you'll, you're, you're, uh, you're warranting a death penalty. In Judaism, we have none of that. We have an idea that is fundamental to Judaism, and that is free will. God gives us all the tools we need to succeed in choosing the right thing. And the Torah in, in Deuteronomy, we have, uh, See, I place before you today life and good, death and bad. Choose, the Torah tells us, God's recommendation, the author's recommendation. He says, editor's note, choose life. It's worth it. What is the essence of all of that? That's investigating in our knowledge of Hashem. Not sufficing with just a cursory investigation, really digging deep into what it means to have knowledge of Hashem. We mentioned previously, we're just going to review a few things that we mentioned in the previous weeks because it's, it's, it's important for us to gain a clear understanding of what's going on. So number one, how do we identify this knowledge of Hashem? Number one, the first thing we have to do is investigate the world that we're living in. Is it possible to have such a sophisticated world, such a perfect world that operates without a master? I'll give you an example. So here I have a cup, typically it's filled with coffee, but let's say, for argument's sake, that today I'm going to fill this up with ink. And I will take this ink and I'm going to throw it up in the ear and that it land on this piece of paper right here and write the letter Aleph. In Times New Roman font, size 64. What is the likelihood that that will happen? How many times do I have to throw this ink up in the ear for it to randomly pick the right font, the right size, neatly on the piece of paper? Probably trillions of times, if any, okay? If it'll even work after a trillion times, if I figure out some type of method, maybe after a trillion times. But even then, what is the likelihood that the next letter of my name, the Resh, will also, I'll be able to throw it up again in the air, the ink, and it land perfectly in line with the olive right next to it in a perfect Times New Roman font, size 64. It's, well, I only have one chance, right? Because after my trillion tries, if I do it one time and it doesn't land perfectly, it's going to erase it because all the ink is going to splatter. So it's not likely that it'll ever happen that my letters of my name which is only four letters, Aleph, Resh, Yud, and Hey, that they land perfectly one next to the other to spell my name. And yet, anyone with intellect is to believe that this sophisticated world that we live in was by chance or by a big bang, by an explosion. It doesn't make any sense. It just simply doesn't make sense to leave it to happenstance, to evolution, or to things just, there is a creator, and we have to instill this into our consciousness. There's a creator who created the world, 
and who maintains this world. Just based on simple logic. There is a creator that created this world and maintains this world and renews it every day. This is part of our prayer that we say every single day. We say, we begin our morning with Modeh Ani Lefanecha. Praised are you, Hashem. Right? Modeh Ani Lefanecha. Melech Haivikam, living God. Shechazarta Binishmati, that you restored my soul within me. Rabbi Munatecha. Very trustworthy is the Almighty. What does that mean? God believes in us. He gives us opportunity every day. Every day that we are on this side of the grass, we're good. We should be ecstatic because God believes in us and he gives us another another chance. So let's begin with understanding number one. It's incumbent on us and each and every one of us to investigate our relationship with God and God's existence in this world. Once we have that clear and we understand that God is the creator of heaven and earth, that God is the creator of everything that happens around us, we gain the knowledge of his existence. We don't have a, we don't take a leap of faith. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It's safer for me to take the yes bet than the no bet. That's not knowledge. The Torah says, It should be a knowledge. We also say, Umala aretz de'ayet Hashem. There will come a time where the earth, the land, will be filled with the knowledge of God. Not the belief of God. The knowledge of God. In Judaism, we want solid, concrete, firm evidence. Look into your, your physical body. Look into your hands. Look into how our system, the human body, works. The remarkable miracles that are every day present to us. As some of you may know, I got a major sports injury in my leg and tore up some of my muscles, my calf muscles, my Achilles. And um, you know what? I asked my son, I said, did you ever see a car get a scratch? They said, yeah. I said, did you ever look at it a day later or two days later and it starts healing? No, we don't have such a thing. We don't have such a concept except with living creatures. With living creatures, animals, humans, God gives this special ability for it to heal itself, obviously with the help of Hashem. When we look into this world and we see the magnificence of Hashem's creation, we are left with only one option but to see the hand of Hashem in everything that goes on around us. So when we talk about this knowledge, what do we call it? We call it emunah. Emunah is similar to the word, is the same root as the word amen. When someone says a blessing, what do we say? Amen means true. Indeed, yes, I confirm. All of these are terms of the word emuna. Amen is yes, I affirm what you are saying. It is true. Emuna is the same idea as that we need to confirm that the existence of God is true. It's not just an idea. It's not just a phrase. It's not just, it's not a belief. It's a knowledge. It's a knowledge of, 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 of Hashem's existence. I just want to want to talk about this idea for a second that when we recognize that everything the Almighty does, everything the Almighty created in this world, we're living in a perfect world. Each individual, each one of us here watching this and learning together was created a an individual in their own world. We're all unique. We all have our own backgrounds. We all have our own families. We all have our own set of problems. We all have our own talents and abilities that are uniquely tailored for each and every one of us to connect to the Almighty. When we recognize in our emunah, in our knowledge of Hashem, that the Almighty created us for a very specific purpose, then every challenge can be handled with greater confidence Every challenge can also be handled in a way that we can be confident that we can succeed and overcome it. Because the Almighty does not put us in a challenge that we cannot accomplish. The Almighty does not put us in a, in a situation that we cannot succeed. It's just like a few weeks ago we read in the Torah portion about Abraham and we read about Noah. 
Parshas Noach was the second portion of Genesis, and then we have Parshas Lech Lecha, which is the third portion in Genesis, and we have the very stark contrast between uh, Noach, who was a righteous person in his generation, with limited, he had a little asterisk on, 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 on his name, and then you have Abraham, who was considered righteous, the father of monotheism, the father of the Jewish nation, who invested a, a great deal in his emunah, in his knowledge of God. He invested and investigated in the relationship with God. What was the difference between the two? Abraham knew with a knowledge that the Almighty is there and therefore was able to overcome all challenges and all tests. He was tested with 10 very serious trials by the Almighty to see that he is real in this relationship. While Noach said, I think I've got this right, but I'm not sure 100%. Not that he didn't, that he had any questions of his faith, but rather it was the investigation that Avram Avinu, that Abraham, our patriarch, invested in this knowledge of God. I want to see God in every area of life. And therefore, he was able to overcome these tests based on that relationship with God. Because he knew, I, if God is putting me into this challenge, I can succeed in this challenge. There is nothing that the Almighty puts us into that we cannot handle. That means that if every person worked, if each and every one of us worked on our emunah, we should be stress-free. We should live a stress-free, happy life because we know that the Almighty is always with us. This should be the medicine of, of every person that is dealing with uh, stress or any type of anxiety or has worries, has fears. Emunah. That's what emunah is. Emunah instills the knowledge of the Almighty being in charge of everything that transpires. And the Almighty who loves me, gives me my soul back every single day because he believes in me, wouldn't put me in a situation that I cannot succeed. A ma'amin, someone who believes in God, has no fear or has very limited fear very limited stress, very limited worries because they cling, they hold on to that relationship with God. The difference of a life of one who is a believer, not in the sense of belief, yeah, just that leap of faith, or someone who is has investigated, again, a believer versus a non-believer, someone who knows of God and one who does not know of God, one is left to the stroke of chance. Yes, maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. It could be, it could not be. And one has confidence and has knowledge in his relationship with Hashem. It's not something that comes to us in just a day. I, I want to I wanna just be, be, be clear that our knowledge of Hashem doesn't just come because one day we listen to a class and we say, you know what, yeah, there is a God. No, it's something that we need to really work on internalizing that idea. I'll share with you a quick story. My grandfather once went to the very holy sage, Reb Chatzka Levenstein. Reb Chatzka Levenstein was the spiritual leader of one of the largest yeshivas in Israel named Ponovich. And my grandfather went to him and was, they were talking about Pesach, the Pesach story, the exodus from Egypt. And the rabbi asked my grandfather, do you believe in the story of Exodus. My grandfather said, of course I believe in the story of Exodus. Who doesn't believe in the story of Exodus? We all grew up observing the Pesach Seder and reading through the Haggadah and acting out many of the scenes of, and he says, do you believe that every person who left Egypt left with 90 donkeys filled with riches? That's what our sages tell us. Now imagine that. Put that, put that image into your mind. 90 donkeys for every person who left Egypt, filled with riches. Just imagine that for a second. Now, there's not many things that are accurate about the Ten Commandments movie, but I think it's worthwhile just to see it for the imagery so that we can put an image into our mind of what the splitting of, of the sea was, what that experience was having millions of people going through on dry land, we always we mentioned this last week and the week before, the idea that if you want to get to a clear understanding of the Almighty's existence, then what you need to do is to investigate all the way down to the end. We know that scientists tell us they can disprove the splitting of the Red Sea. Why? 
because water coming from a certain angle can split any body of water. Oh, well, that can contradict the Jewish idea of God splitting the sea. You see, it was just uh, scientific. It was circumstantial. It was the right time, right place. Or we can look further into what the Torah tells us and that the Jewish people passed through the sea on dry land. Ah, that is a part of the story that the scientists and all of the happenstance world, they can't comprehend. They can't explain that. Yeah, perhaps you could split the water. Perhaps scientifically you can show that this is just an occurrence of nature. Or you can look one step deeper and see, you know what? This is indeed the hand of Hashem. So when you look further and further and further, I I mentioned this previously in many different classes, it was such an important moment of my life. You know, many of you may know I am a first responder. I'm very privileged and honored to be part of the uh, Houston Hatzalah, which is a first responders, you know, volunteer member organization. And we had to be trained and we had to take many tests. And I remember when we were doing our education, most of us did it online. So they were talking about how the heart and the lungs work so perfectly together. And it's really a remarkable gift of the Almighty. And I remember at one point they were talking about how in the alveoli, right, there is an exchange of carbon dioxide and um, oxygen that transfers and goes back into the blood. It gives the blood fresh oxygenated blood and takes away the carbon dioxide and we breathe that out. And we in, intake, we inhale new fresh oxygen, goes into our lungs. Again, you have that exchange. You know how many times a day? We have it multiple times every second. You multiply that by how many breaths you take in your lifetime. It's talking about billions of times that this miracle happens inside our lungs. And this person narrating the course online was saying, we don't know exactly how this happens but somehow Mother Nature figured it out. We have no clue. We really, we, yeah, they can give you many different ideas and theories as to how it works. But when you get down to the last dot, it's like, well, it just happens. It just works. Well, if we live in an existence where we know Hashem is there, it's not difficult for us to know how. It's the Almighty who makes this miracle happen for us every single day of our existence. And it's a miracle that if we just stop and recognize that every breath we take, you know, I was teaching my son just this week how to take a pulse. So I was showing him on my hand and he says, it's bumping, it's bumping. (laughs) He says, he feels he's seven years old and he's feeling, I said, you know what that is? I said, that's the pulse that comes from your heart and your heart is a pump and it's pumping Every second, many sometimes more than a second, depending on your age, depending on your health, right? It's pumping your blood throughout your body so that you have oxygen coming to every single last cell in your body. It's unbelievable. It's not just a bump. It's not just a coincidence. This is the Almighty within us every moment, every single moment. The more we're able to live with that knowledge, the more resolute we are in our day to know Hashem is with me. I feel it in my pulse. God is in my veins. I see him. I feel him. This is on a very internal, personal level, but we can take this to every area of our lives. In Judaism, here's the thing. It's a very interesting thing. In other religions, and we mentioned this previously as well, so please forgive me. This is the first one we're doing when we're online and we're uh, we're recording this as well. Um, So I'm just going to review some of the things we mentioned previously. In other religions, it's all based on an individual revelation, whether it was Muhammad or it was JC, who had a revelation saying that, take my word for it because I'm telling you This happened. And in some religions, they say, you better believe it or you're dead. So we have this this individual's revelation, and you better believe it because otherwise you're a heretic, you're a you're 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 bound to be in eternal damnation, eternal damnation, right? Or you're gonna be you're a uh, an infidel and you deserve death. In Judaism, we don't have such a thing as an individual revelation. We have a national revelation where all of the Jewish people stood at the foot of Mount Sinai and they experienced the same exact thing. 
And every person from their perspective around the mountain saw exactly the same thing. It's not a hypothesis. It's not a perspective. I saw it like this because when you have a document like the Torah that is given the day Moshe dies, he gives 13 copies, 12, one to each tribe and one that's placed in the ark. Each is exactly the same, not missing a letter, not added a letter. The same exact document. Just as a contrast, we mentioned that in Islam, before Muhammad died, there were already 400 different versions of the Quran. We have only one version of the Torah, 3,300 years since it was given at Mount Sinai. Only one version of the Torah. You go into any synagogue around the globe, and they have exactly the same Torah with exactly the same num- number of letters, with exactly the same number of words. Not a single letter is missing. And here with all 12 tribes get the same exact Torah. And they read through it and they're like, yeah, <laughs> that, exact, that exactly is what happened. We all experience this exactly the way it is written. We all witnessed this. We all saw this. It, there's no place for speculation. Because every single person experienced it exactly the way it was written. If it wasn't that way, what would happen? You'd throw it out. You'd dispose of it and you'd say, well, it's not true. This is not what happened. We don't have any record of such in the history of the Jewish people. We're just, where people dispute the fact of the Torahs, of the revelations of God. So we have the creation of the world. We have the receiving of the Torah. And we have the final redemption, which all of these, right, it's very interesting. If you look into some of the details of the creation of the world, why the Almighty created the world the way he created it. I don't want to get too much into it right now, but just if you take the very first verse, take the very first verse, that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. If you look at the name of God, There are many different names of God, and every name represents a different characteristic of God's traits. One is more judgment, one is more kind, one is more forgiving, etc., etc. The way the Torah begins is with judgment, with the name of God, which is judgment, accountability. But then it flips, it switches, and it goes to the name of God, which is kind and merciful. Well, why does it start one way and continue another way? So the first Rashi, the great commentator Rashi, on this first verse of the Torah, he explains that originally the Almighty wanted to create the world with the laws of accountability, of judgment. But he saw that the world cannot survive just by judgment. It needs to have the influence of kindness, forgiveness. We're going to make mistakes. And that's how God instilled into this world this idea of forgiveness. The greatest gift, repentance. We're going to make mistakes. God doesn't eliminate us when we make a mistake. It's not Iran. In Iran, you steal only once. Or at least they catch you stealing only once. Because you steal, they chop off your hands, and now you're not going to steal anymore. That's judgment. We live in in a society where there is the idea of that you can restore yourself, you can fix yourself. Yeah, and people go to the prison system and many people remake who they are, right? And we bring them back into society and we give them jobs and there's special incentives for businesses to hire people who have had uh, more challenging pasts. We believe in mercy. We believe in forgiveness. We believe in change. That's the gift that the Almighty gives us inside the beginning of creation. But then you look a little bit further and God says, should we create man? Who's God talking to? Who's we? And the Talmud goes into the, right, you look at the Midrash. The the Midrash talks about who God is talking to. He's talking to the angels. And at first the angels said no. And another set of angels said no. And then the third set of angels said, fine, let's create man. But why is God including them? Because God is showing his own humility. God is showing his own humility, that he's sort of including everybody, his own creations, the angels, into this decision of let's create man. Let's give him opportunity. Let's give him chance. So we have, if we look 
through God's handiwork, its wisdom, its kindness, yet God is still hidden from us. We don't find, you know, imagine that any of us, okay, Linda, how much would you pay to see God? You go into a, uh, to God's palace and you have to pay the gatekeepers to, to visit with God, to have us some, some time with God. How much would you pay for that, for that opportunity? We pay a lot of money. Why not? It's, it's a pretty good opportunity, you know, see God sitting on his throne. So I want to know, is it gold? Is it silver? Platinum? Like, you know, to see, does God have a crown? What type of crown? The diamonds? Let's get some ideas of a fashion, you know? So you go in and you pay, you pay the people you, you need to pay and you get to the gates of God's palace. You're finally walking in there and you meet God. You say, God, it's an honor to meet you. Finally. So, okay, now you finished your meeting. Would you ever have a doubt in your mind that there's a God? No, because you met him. You saw him. You spoke to him. He talked back to you. You know now that there is a God. From that point on, what happens is, is that you can never, ever have any doubts in your belief of God because you saw him. And that would remove your free will. You would never be able to have free will again. Because now that I know that there's a God and there's accountability, I have no choice. I have no choice but to believe in God. And that's why we don't see God. Except in his ways. We see God through his actions. We see God through his ways. And that's the way we connect to God. And that's the way we see with verification that he is there. So an, a, another example, another way in which we can, we can accomplish that is through prayer. When we talk to God and put that image of God standing on the throne and we're standing right in front of him and we see that he responds through the things that go on in our lifetime, he responds, yes, you're looking for a job, I'm going to help you with the job. Yes, you're looking for, for livelihood, I'll help you with livelihood. Yes, you're looking for, for a spouse, I'll help you with the spouse. Everything that you're looking for, God assists us with. He listens to our prayers. We still have that choice. We still have that free will, but also have the ability to strengthen our relationship with God with the knowledge of his existence. So let's continue here. Still, if we look deeply into creation, we will see great levels of faith and the hand of Hashem in everything that we do. This is how our patriarchs, this is how they connected with the Almighty. How does the world spin on its axis? Who spins it? You think of all of the, the majesty of the world we're living in. And to leave it to happenstance is a joke. You can't, we mentioned this earlier, you can't randomly write your name on a piece of paper by throwing ink into the air. You can't magically create a universe that's so perfect and so... Do you know that if the sun... You know, it's an interesting thing. You can look right now a thousand years ahead on the calendar and see what time sunset and sunrise will be. And you can look back a thousand years and see what time sunrise and sunset was. And you can look ahead a month and two months and three months. How can you? How can we tell? Maybe it'll be different. If we ever have one day where the sun says, mm, I'm sorry, I was late. I was on a coffee break and I forgot. I didn't realize I needed to sun. I needed to rise, you know, at six o'clock this morning. At 6.05, you know what would happen? There would be total chaos in the world. There is absolute perfection in the world we're living in. And we need to recognize this. We need to recognize and, again, identify that this perfection is the hand of Hashem. It's not random. Okay? Each and every one of us have our own lives that can identify in its own special, unique way that perfection. At the beginning of, of creation, everyone believed in God, but eventually their faith changed. That faith went to angels, stars, great powers, physical entities that also took that. There was, no, there was no doubt in the beginning of creation of God's existence. But then it was sort of dispersed among all of the elements of this world. But let's think of God speaking to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. God spoke to us directly. We all heard it. There is a testimony that was a public revelation given to the entire people and documented for the entire people, not privately, where it was given to all the people to say, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Indeed. By the way, when Moses spoke to God privately, what happened? Everybody heard it. Everybody saw it. 
He spoke privately in the tent. But there was a cloud that descended over the tent. Everybody knew there was communication going on here. They were able to hear the reverberations of that speech. So it's not just an individual has his own revelation. It's an individual that has a revelation that everyone can attest to because they see it. We have the stories of Egypt, of the plagues. We have the stories of the splitting of the sea, like we mentioned previously. We have the stories of the giving of the Torah. It's a personal relationship with the Jewish people that is expressed in this Torah. It's the personal relationship that God has with every single one of us that we can derive from the Torah. Right? So each and every one of us in our own personal lives can extract that personal relationship through our own experiences, through our own life that we are experiencing every day. We can connect to the Almighty in a way that nobody else can. But the only way to attain it is to invest time in it. We need to invest time in our relationship with God. We need to see the acts of God in this world and connect with it. We say in, in the uh, beginning of the Amidah, which we say three times a day on a regular ordinary day, on a special day like Shabbos and, and, and Rosh Chodesh and holidays, we say it four times because we add the Musaf prayer. So we start off at Lekei Avraham, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And our sages ask, why is it necessary for us to say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Shouldn't it just say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It's a good question. Why does it need to specify each one? Again, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Our sages explain, because every single one of our ancestors identified with God in their own unique way. To Abraham, it was through kindness. To Isaac, it was through judgment. To Jacob, it was through truth. That was his own trait. And he saw the truth in the world, of God's world. He said, ah, there must be a God. I see the truth here. Abraham saw the kindness in the world. And he said, ah, there must be a God of kindness. Our relationship when we talk about God is one that is is asking and is, again, we mentioned this, right? We need to investigate in that relationship with God through our own selves. So if I'm a person of kindness, let's look into the world and see kindness of God. If I'm a person of truth, let's see God's truth and identify it. And that's the amazing thing that we see in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of our following ancestors, whether it was Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, they each had their own way of connecting with the Almighty that was unique. It was special. So it's, it's important to take the time and look into, you know, my grandfather uh, mentions that he had seven amazing miracles that happened to him that made him who he was. And if these seven miracles all didn't happen, if one of them was missing, he wouldn't have become who he was. He talks about his childhood when him and his father were going for a walk and they met a rabbi. That rabbi introduced him to uh, observant Judaism. My grandfather did not grow up a rabbi. He did not grow up religious. He grew up in a very, very secular home. And only through meeting that rabbi who sent him later to yeshiva in Frankfurt, and then later uh, he went to a different yeshiva, which t- led him to the Mir yeshiva. Each one of those miracles that transpired was God taking him and putting him in the right place at the right time. We like to call it happenstance, right? We like to say it was just uh, a, a, a random occurrence. There's no such thing. There's no random occurrence. It's God picking us up and putting us in that right place. How many people do we know that met their significant other, their spouse, and we call it random? I don't know. We just met at a party. No. God told you, get yourself dressed and go there. And God told them, get yourself dressed and go there. And they met there. God, it says that what is God busy doing all day? What is God doing right now all day? The Talmud says he is putting together brides and grooms. And we have right now a groom with us right here on, on online here with us, Yisrael Mayer. I want to wish you again a mazel tov, right? He's right now in Jerusalem and he met a, a wonderful girl, beautiful girl from Brazil. And they just got engaged in Jerusalem. He's also from South America. And it really is an amazing thing that, you know, God 
circles around the whole world. This girl has to go to Jerusalem. This guy has to end up, come through Houston, go to, to Jerusalem, and boom, they meet. It's not a random. It's not a happenstance. It's not just a, you know, a, a random occurrence. Because that's one of the great points. Why does it say that God is matching up bride and groom? Because that's the time that all of the world that led up to that point and all of the world that led up for each of those individuals comes together. It's like those worlds come together. Our sages teach us that the soul of a bride and groom are two halves of one whole. And they come together. God has to bring the whole world together to make these two meet. So we can say, oh, it just happened. It happened to be at the right place at the right time. Or I can see the big hand of Hashem guiding me, persuading me to go be at that place at that time, to meet that person, to be introduced to that individual, to get the job or whatever other event happens. Our blessings that we say when we refer to the Almighty, we say Baruch Atah. Hashem. We talk directly to God because we have a very direct relationship with the Almighty. And the more we invest in that relationship, the more personal that relationship becomes. The more we see Hashem in every single act that we do, in every single incident that happens, we see it's a personal message where the Almighty is communicating us with us directly. So we have many different parts of our prayers, of our liturgy that express that faith. For example, we talk about in the Kaddish, we say Yitkadal v'yitkadash Shmei May God's name become great and, and holy and sanctified throughout the world. Where God created this world, God made this world great. God gave us this opportunity to have this knowledge of God in this world. And what we do, by the way, as being representatives of the Almighty in this world, God chose us as the chosen nation. God chose us to be his representative to the world. Representatives. Each and every one of us have an opportunity every single day to bring God into this world. When people see that we do our business dealings with honesty, that we have proper respect for other human beings, that we give, we, we, we have the proper courtesy for others, that we conduct our lives with proper character. They say, ah, that's a person of God. And then we, what we did is we sanctified God's name by bringing him into this world. That's what we ask for in Kaddish. We're saying we, we, in this very special, powerful prayer, We want God to be brought into this world and all of the other worlds because we have all of these distractions. We have the distractions of materialism. We have the distractions of physicality, which blurs our spiritual vision. You know, it's a very amazing thing. When we say the Shema every day, what do we do? We cover our eyes. We take our right hand, the hand of kindness, and we cover our eyes. Why do we cover our eyes? Our sages teach us because our eyes are physical. But we also have spiritual eyes up there in our, in our minds. We have spiritual eyes. And what we need to do is because we have the distraction of the physical world, that persuades us that things are real in the physical world, that things are uh, eternal in this physical world, and they're not. So what we do is when we recite the Shema, which is the uh, mission statement of the Jewish people, what we do is we close our eyes, we cover our eyes, so that our spiritual eyes can connect with the Almighty, so that we remove those distractions, we remove those other aspects of the world that can be a distraction from our clarity and vision of the Almighty. And we can focus on what it is, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, that Hashem is our God, and Hashem is one, and Hashem's oneness. So we say that, and by the way, we said emunah, the word emunah, it comes from the root of amen, which means truth, which means trusted. You know what else? It's very interesting. Right before we say the Shema, what do we say? We say three beautiful words, el melech ne'eman, that God is the trusted king. Those three words, the acronym is amen, el melech ne'eman. 
Aleph, Mem, and Nun. The name of Hashem that we try to bring into our lives, we try to bring it into our consciousness, bring it into our every action that we do every day. That is our goal. Our goal is to connect with the Almighty through everything that happens, not to leave things to happenstance, not to leave things to a, a random occurrence. It's not a random occurrence. God is there with us every moment. And the more we engage in that relationship, the more we will see the beauty of that relationship. To uh, those of you listening on the podcast, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Arya Walby. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me at awolbe, A-W-O-L-B-E, at torchweb.org. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Shalom from Texas. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcast.com.